Moment hat die Absicht, eine Mauer zu errichten. The Eagle has landed. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Was hat der Becker? Schießt deine Erinnerungsfote von der Tribüne aus. At Facebook is just help people connect and communicate more efficiently. Wir werden uns von ihrem Wahnsinn nicht anstecken lassen. I say five in the word. Ich bin ein Violina. Hi, I'm Lajos. I'm um, working for Axel Springer in Germany. Uh, we are located in Berlin. And I'm the head of our online development department of Die Welt Group. So, uh, and as you have seen in the previous movie, we are taking care about news. So, uh, currently we are responsible for about six uh, different kind of news portals. Um, yes, and uh, this is only a subset of uh, a lot of other digital brands we own. Um, so, a short question to the audience. Who actually knows Axel Springer here? Can I get a hand sign? Wow, all right. More than I expected. But anyway, I give you a short introduction. So, Axel Springer founded his publishing house uh, in uh, 1946 in a small warehouse in, uh, in Hamburg. And it grew to one of the biggest publishing houses in, uh, in Europe. And nowadays we have more than 12,800 employees operating in more than 40 countries. And we're leading currently the, the German print market. But as you might also heard, the classical journalism is currently really facing the digital transformation. So uh, there are different kind of brands in, um, in, in Germany that had to shut down their business, like the Frankfurter Rundschau or the Financial Times Germany. Um, and there are other brands like the Newsweek and La Tribune that, um, that had to stop their print production. And also the Washington Post, um, one of the newspapers that is, re that is really standing for high quality journalism, uh, have been bought by uh, Jeff Bezos, the CEO of uh, Amazon. And we are currently, we, we don't know what this means to the, the high quality journalism. So our mission is actually to save the diverse, independent and high quality journalism, also in a digital world. And Axel Springer is actually doing very well. So when you take a look on the revenues, on the total revenues in 2008, only 14% came from the digital area. And already five years later, half of our total revenues came from the digital sector. So how does Axel Springer did this change so quickly? So everything started uh, in 2006 when Axel Springer started to invest in the digital transformation. So um, on the one hand side, we acquired different kind of online companies. So like a real estate portal called Immonet, uh, a price comparison engine called Idealo, or um, a Stepstone, a job portal, and many, many more. On the other hand, uh, we also grew organically. So this means that we also created our own digital brands. Um, there are a lot. And we also uh, invested in a lot of different kind of startups. And currently, it's really a great time at Axel Springer because um, every one to two months, there are new com uh, companies that are joining the Axel Springer family. So, but actually, we are not the only uh, industry that is facing the, the digital transformation, though um, also other industries are, are 
have to deal with this, with this issue. So let me introduce you now to Tore, the CTO of Fjord IT. Thank you. Yes, hi everyone. I'm Tore at uh, Fjord IT. At uh, Fjord IT, we are delivering uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service uh, for Lyos and, and, and Matthias that you will meet afterwards. We are delivering infrastructure as a service and of course uh, Cloud Foundry since, since, since we are here. Uh, we've been doing that for, for quite uh, uh, a long time, uh, but we also in, in these transition uh, projects, there is always a way from A to B, and that doesn't happen uh, like this just over, overnight. So we, we actually teamed with, uh, with the previous uh, uh, vendors of Axel Springer, the, guy, the guys delivering paper. So paper is the analog distribution of, uh, of uh, papers, or not of papers, but newspapers. Uh, and we have added the digital platform. So we are working together with Norske Skog, that's, the, that's a global uh, paper mill. Uh, they have a very power demanding industry, so are we. They have a lot of space, we need space. So we teamed up with them to, to do a transition for all the media companies from paper to digital over a time or over a number of years, uh, and then being able to have the track record from, from the paper industry and adding the new uh, sales channel like the uh, digital um, digital uh, platform. So a little bit more about Fjord IT. As you see, we have been around since uh, 97. Um, we did a, done a lot of different things. We even added some weight over time, but uh, at least we got uh, three years ago, we, we started looking at what, what should we do next? What's the next wave in IT? So we looked at uh, cloud. Cloud is obviously uh, becoming a, a big trend um, uh, moving forward. Uh, and we thought about uh, what can we do uh, to, to differentiate from the big players like IBM or HP or, or whoever. So we saw what is the benefit of being in Norway? What is the benefit of having the uh, paper mills uh, on our side? It's uh, hydropower. <coughs> in Norway, we have 98.5% uh, on the power grid is renewable. So it's from the waterfalls. Uh, and we actually have a waterfall and, and a hydro plant on our facility where we are building the, uh, the data center. It's not in the data center, but uh, close by. So we don't have water cooling. We actually have our own patented free cooling. Uh, so we don't use any energy on cooling of the, uh, of the servers or the uh, data center. That's also a little bit uh, due to that Norway is uh, way up north and it's not as hot it's as in uh, San Francisco or San Jose or further down south. But we don't use any, any power on uh, cooling, so that's 20% uh, down on the uh, power consumption. We only do renewable energy, uh, so that's also a very, very good, uh, good thing. Uh, that means that we can fight the cost level of the big international players. And we can scale our data center to these paper mills in, um, in Norske Skog, so we can build rapidly uh, a large number of uh, data center facilities. And I don't know, you're all aware of environmental issues. That's, uh, you should be at least. Everyone is uh, living on this planet, so we should uh, definitely care about it. We, uh, as an IT industry, we passed the air traffic with the carbon footprint in 2007. So we are polluting a lot. And if uh, the data center business was a, was a country, we would be consuming the same amount of power as Germany does today. So it's a huge industry. And you know that the cloud, uh, cloud uh, <coughs> offerings is, is rapidly growing. So if we're keeping up at this pace, we will destroy the planet. So it's important to do the right thing about, uh, about data centers. And if you come to Fjord IT, you can be, all be a part of that story. So that's a good thing. Lyos had chosen that a long time ago. So this is just to summarize the, uh, the, what we do at, uh, at the Fjord IT. Infrastructure, platform, software as a service and in a cloud delivery model, cloud business model. And that cloud thing is what you are concerned about. A little bit cloudy uh, <laughs> uh, what we can deliver and uh, actually also what we can execute on. So back to you. All right, thanks. So in our opinions, a way from print to online-driven journalism is cloudy. So I'm now very pleased to present to you now the pro our cloud project where we introduce Cloud Foundry to our company. So when you take a look on the current system infrastructure of Die Welt, uh, you, you will find a very complex 
and also historically grown infrastructure with a big monolithic content management system where a lot of our features have been implemented inside. So, um, furthermore, we, um, we, we, our software components uh, having a very low uh, test coverage, we have something between 6 and 13 percent, so really bad. So we really have to deal with legacy code. Um, we have a very low degree of process automation. Um, yeah, so somehow you could compare our current situation with the production line from Volkswagen here um, in the 60s. Yeah, so somehow productive, but still a lot of hard manual work and obviously uh, not anymore state of the art. So this is a production line of Devet. So nothing very special. We having an existing piece of software, we are doing a change there or uh, we're creating a new piece of software, we're building our software, we're rolling it out onto our uh, test stage, then we run our little automated test suite against it, and then we have a lot of efforts in manual testing. And finally, we roll out everything again onto a, a production system, and there we run all the tests again uh, against the production system. So the whole process takes us currently about 14 man hours and actually uh, about 70% of the overall process is manual work. So this is the production line of Volkswagen today, fully automated. And this was actually also the goal for our cloud project, to create a fully automated production line. So let's have a deeper look into the requirements we had on an innovative service architecture. So first of all, we, um, we wanted to increase our time and quantity to market rate. And at the same time, we wanted to reduce our operational cost. Furthermore, we want to be able to really quickly react on change requests, on uh, bug reports and feature requests. We also wanted to invest in, uh, in mandatory software quali quality standards. And um, as I told you before, we have a lot of different kind of subsidiaries. And currently, they are all disconnected. So also all IT departments are disconnected. And we recognize, actually, that, that uh, Cloud Foundry could be a perfect synergy enabler to, to share services. So our vision for this project was to create a cloud-based service platform that supports a rapid development process. So um, we want to be able to, yeah, to, to, to receive all these crazy ideas from our editors, from our business units, and also from our developers, putting them on our new production line, running them to our new service fabric, and blowing them out really quickly to the market. So let me introduce you now to Matthias Naba, who is one of our leading engineers in, uh, for this cloud project, and he will tell you now more about how we drove our vision to become reality. Yeah, thank you, Lars. So I will be covering the more technical part of this case study. So let me start with what we've done. In early 2013, we started our evaluation process. So as you can see on the slide, we had some contestants for what cloud we may uh, base our future on. So we did some criteria that you would expect from such a software system when it comes to the maturity of the product, the quality of the documentation, of course, the pricing, scaling capabilities, and technical capabilities. At the end of this process, we came up with two winners. The first one is Cloud Foundry, and the second one is for Public Cloud's Heroku. Then there was another criteria. Um, we call datability, so the responsible and sustainable treatment of data. Uh, I'm pretty sure you all heard of this NSA thing that happened like a year ago. There is this PRISM project and the yes, NSA is buying. There's this Patriot Act in the United States. And so we decided, or we had to decide, to use a private cloud foundry installation in a European data center. So to again remember where we came from, we had a content management system in the center of our environment, and we are pretty much bound to a 
Java development process. That means Java and JSP. There was nothing else to do. So it was a pretty, pretty slow development process. It was hard to do that. Ascenic, as such, is pretty slow and doesn't scale very well. So having chosen Cloud Foundry as our platform, as a cloud platform, we have now been giving a whole lot of opportunities to choose whichever technology we like, whatever programming language we like, and whatever framework we like. Thanks to dozens of build packs supplied by Pivotal or the community. So what did we usually do when we started the project? We had to fill forms. We had to order servers, we had to care about IP addresses, we had to maybe uh, order some database space. It took days, it was annoying. Then after that, of course, the operating system had to be patched, servers has to be installed, configured. Again, it took days. At the end, maybe you have to scale, increase memory, CPU, increase the instances. That again was an expensive thing. But now with Cloud Foundry, we shrink it down to minutes, only minutes. And we now can concentrate on the thing we like the most, is developing software. So let's have a deeper dive into the infrastructure part. And I hand over once more to Tora. Yeah. Just one more slide. <clears throat> So we're do, doing the infrastructure as a service layer and, and, and on top of that uh, pass, of course. But we were very happy to hear that SAP and HP uh, on the stage yesterday said that uh, if you have a pass layer, if you have Cloud Foundry, that's all we need to, to deliver our services. We couldn't be more agree, uh, couldn't agree more, uh, more to that. Uh, the infrastructure beneath, the infrastructure as a service is becoming commoditized. So there are, there are things that, that need to be in place. You have to be able to scale, orchestrate, and do, do the right thing. Uh, but we also think that uh, this is where the place where you put your sustainability, the green part, making sure that you do the right thing on, on, on that level, and then just handing it over to, uh, to, to the guys doing the uh, pass layer and, and do the applications and services on top of it. So we use uh, vBlocks today. We're moving uh, not away from it, but adding to it with the open compute. Uh, and we have the open source, and we have the, the more enterprise way of doing. So there you go. So let me continue with the software, um, with the platform layer. Um, what we have today is a installation of Cloud Foundry version 1.1 at the data center of Yodity. Um, we have some logging uh, provided. Previously, you heard there is uh, Splunk. We decided to use Logstash. This is also connected to the log aggregator of Cloud Foundry. And then we use some external services. We have Datadog connected to the Bosch Health Monitor and the Cloud Foundry Collector to just getting metrics out of the system. Then we have Pingdom to check the general availability of uh, Cloud Foundry in our applications. And last but not least, we have PagerDuty. This is a bridge into operation stuff that they may uh, take action if something is wrong. So back at the data center, we also installed some infrastructure, which is mostly databases and messaging. And these components are interconnected to Cloud Foundry via these so-called user-provided services. So with this system given, we now uh, have to approach the software de development process. So we have to change the software paradigm on how software gets implemented. We came from a as I said, Java-based environment, low test coverage, low automatization. There is this monolithic CMS in the center, and we have to change all of this. We have to increase the code coverage. We have to automate everything. And the goal was to introduce a continuous delivery workflow. So as we are mainly still Java developers, we use tools like Jenkins, Nexus, SonarCube. It won't surprise us. We use Gradle as our build tool. And there's been a great talk of Gradleware, where they introduced uh, how you could implement a continuous delivery pipeline based on Gradle. So we took that as an inspiration and combined that with the also very awesome Cloud Foundry Gradle plugin and built this continuous delivery pipeline. So upon a commit from a developer, we compile, we unit test, we do integration test, we do this code analysis with SonarCube. And then we build our artifact. That artifact gets shipped to a certain stage, get then tested again, and if everything is okay, we do this 
zero downtime green blue deployment with the Gradle plugin. We repeat that from stage to stage, and it's a process of only 10 minutes to get a change that the developer has made to a production system safely and securely with the required security that it will work. So let me summarize what we have after several months of using Cloud Foundry. I will start with the negative points. Datadog, this was the uh, collection of the metrics. It has not yet been released. It is therefore not very well do documented. You have to dig through some GitHub release uh, commits and just yeah, analyze how it's working. It's pretty unstable so far, but we hope that it gets some drive in the future to get it more stable because it's a really important uh, instrument to see what's happening inside Cloud Foundry. So then, at some point, uh, it was like two months ago, we tried to upgrade Cloud Foundry 1.0 to 1.1, and it was a big hassle. There was more of a re reinstallation than an upgrade process. It was pretty frustrating and time consuming. We're hoping that the next upgrade to version 1.2 that is released like several weeks ago will be much smoother. Then there are services. It also, sadly, some issues with that. It was, uh, let's take, for example, RabbitMQ. Um, we ran into a problem. We installed RabbitMQ via the Pivotal Cloud Foundry, and we couldn't bind the, app, the service created to the application. So we contacted the the customer support, and we had like two solutions. The one was reinstall everything, which again is pretty frustrating, or even wait for the next release to come. This would be Cloud Foundry 1.2, and it meant to wait several weeks for that update. And then, of course, Bosch. Funny story, we tried to test the self-healing capabilities of Cloud Foundry and played Chaos Monkey. So we're randomly shutting down some components, and it turned out it isn't a good idea to open a root shell into a DEA and type halt into the shell. The system went down and never went up again, sadly. Okay, it was a testing system, but... So let's come to the positive sides. Stability. Apart from the thing I told you, we had virtually no downtime so far. We are running Cloud Foundry for several months now, not a single downtime. This is awesome. Then the maintenance. This whole system is only operated by two people. One of them is me, and I'm really happy that they don't have to do it very much. It's a really great system, very complex, and only two people needed to do this work. Great, also great. The next thing is community. If you ever have contacted the mailing list, you've got a great feedback. Thanks for that. Then our developer feedback. They're really looking forward to use Cloud Foundry. They're really happy to leave the Java and JSP-based environment that they are now in, and looking forward to have this whole bunch of opportunities to develop their softwares. And last but not least, the monitor monitoring capabilities of Cloud Foundry are also awesome. Once you get Datadog running and um, LogSash running, you have a great insight into what is happening in Cloud Foundry. It's a really good thing to have if you run a productive system with that. So what else is there? We are looking forward for this auto-scaling feature that came with Cloud Foundry 1.2 to even be more resource efficient. Then there will be a file system service, which is also nice to have, to have a persistent file storage for applications. And then there is the uh, investigation in how we could use hybrid clouds for applications that do not require private data. So, Lars. Would you be so kind? Yeah. All right. So before I finish up the talk, I really want to take the opportunity to um, say thanks to the Cloud Foundry community because you really helped us to make a tremendous step forward. So thank you very much for that. So we didn't talk so far about software as a service. So also here the car industry is uh, offering us a very nice analogy. Um, Volkswagen created the MQB. They call it also the platform. So this is this nice metal frame. And um, this metal frame is actually used for different kind of car classes. So a Volkswagen Passat has the same platform as a Skoda Octavia. And um, furthermore, uh, Volkswagen 
um, went uh, one step beyond. They also took care about a modularization strategy. So this means that whenever they create now a new feature for their car, they think about what could be the generic part of my feature that I can reuse for different kind of car classes. And this is actually uh, that what we also had in mind in order to cooperate with our subsidiaries. So in the near future, we really want to create the software as a service layer with different kind of services like a com community services, location-based services, uh, image scaling services, whatever comes uh, in our minds in future. And then we have a lot of different kind of apps coming from our different kind of brands and subsidiaries. And uh, so we are really looking forward that we are now having a common platform where we are able to share our services and in order to also reduce, um, yeah, to also reduce our resources, uh, our, um, <laughs> not resources, our, uh, the cost. So we are going, uh, we, we are currently starting to create a new Axel Springer marketplace uh, by providing a service repository. Some of the services uh, Matthias already mentioned, so we um, integrated MySQL, MongoDB, uh, RabbitMQ. We are currently working on Elasticsearch. Um, and we have also these, um, these services, application-driven services in mind, like a voting module or image scaling service or push service for uh, mobile devices. All right, so let's have a, a short look on our future work. So what we also want to achieve is uh, to introduce the culture of prototyping to our company in the way that we are creating or implementing the build measure learn cycle. So whenever we are now creating new features, uh, we really try to create a minimal viable product that we are really quickly delivering to the market. And then we really have to measure how the user behaves in order to learn um, how does the user accept our feature, can we improve our feature? So in order to improve the minimal viable product. So with the help of Cloud Foundry, we, uh, we were very easily able to establish continuous delivery. And what we are currently missing is a business intelligence system. So we have uh, two projects going on. One is um, about uh, tracking, so different kind of tracking technologies in order to create reports. And then we have a very nice uh, project together with Optimizely going on. So Optimizely is taking care about web, uh, about uh, A-B testing. And they offering now a very nice API um, in order to adapt uh, A-B testing also to your uh, established processes. So it's actually very nice. And they have a very comfortable uh, user interface to analyze your, uh, the, the results of your A-B tests. So you see Axel Springer is on a really interesting and, and uh, exciting journey. And it's really great to be part of this journey currently. And, um, but uh, I have to say, um, if you want to be successful, we, evolution is really the key. And uh, Charles Darwin said once in a time uh, that not the strongest species will survive, and also not the, the most intelligent species will survive. It is the one that is able to easily adapt to changes. And this is actually how we also behave. We're always looking for the next step forward. Thank you. <laughs>